Uh, good day, this is Job Aguas, and welcome to my virtual classroom in philosophy. Now, I will be starting a new series of lectures in philosophy, and this new series is on modern philosophy. So this first uh, lecture in this series is an introduction to modern philosophy. Okay? So let's start. Um, Western philosophy is generally subdivided into the four major periods of the development of Western philosophy. So of course we start with the ancient Greek period where we discuss the pre-Socratics uh, and the three major philosophers during that era, uh, namely Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and the post-Socratic philosophers like Epicurus, uh, <clears throat> uh, the Stoics, uh, and the other uh, philosophers who follow the tradition of Plato, the Neoplatonist. And then after the uh, ancient Greek philosophy, we have medieval philosophy. Uh, in between the Greek ancient philosophy and the, uh, the, mod the, the medieval period, there is a, a very important uh, period between these two in that the patristic era or patristic period, the period of the early fathers of the church. And then you have medieval philosophy, okay, and dominated by scholasticism. So the main uh, philosophy during the medieval is scholasticism. Of course, before that, you have the patristic philosophy. Uh, the main representative of this patristic philosophy is St. Augustine. And then in medieval philosophy, we have St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Albert the Great, St. Bonaventure, and the many other clerics during the era. And then after that, we have modern philosophy. In modern philosophy, uh, the first historical period of modern philosophy would be the Renaissance. And then it would develop towards the uh, period of enlightenment. And then after the modern philosophy, we have contemporary philosophy. Okay, the contemporary philosophy, there are many now philosophical systems that is proud, that emerge. Uh, <clears throat> we have, uh, of course, existentialism, phenomenology, uh, uh, Marxism or historical dialectical, uh, dialectical materialism, positivism, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, we are now what many uh, philosophers or thinkers would call the postmodern era. In fact, there is now a, uh, well, discussions that this is no longer the postmodern, it is already a post postmodern era. All right, but that will not be our topic. So we go back to the modern period, okay, the modern period. So just an overview of this period. This period roughly covers the years from 14, 50, that's about the start of the Renaissance, to 1799, okay? So that's roughly the, the coverage of this modern period in philosophy, in Western philosophy. So the transition from the medieval to the modern world was long and complicated, and sometimes violent, okay? This transition came in several fronts. First, in the area of science, uh, scientific discoveries push man to or man's understanding of the universe to unprecedented limit. Scientific laws were able to explain how the physical reality operates without reference to the divine laws, which was, of course, the reference of the prior era of medieval, classic medieval era. In politics and society, we saw the decline of the influence of the authority of the church. And in the, of course, in the political sphere, and political states were formed and declared their independence. So during the medieval era, the church was so influential that the Pope even settled disputes. Okay. Uh, kings and emperors, they seek the approval. Or the blessing of the of the Pope. Okay, so that's how dominant the Church was during the medieval era. 
but in the modern era, uh, states were established and they no longer have to seek the approval of the church. Okay. And in economics, there is growth of capitalism out of the economic structure of feudal society during the medieval period. Okay. So there came the rise of great commercial city states in northern Italy during the 14th and 15th centuries. And the rise of a rich commercial class who were educated, political, secular, that set this economic transition process. Okay, we know that during the medieval, only the aristocrat, uh, the noble, have access to the manuscripts. Of course, they are the ones who are wealthy and educated. But during the modern times, this all changed. Right. So there is a a new rich commercial class that emerged, and they set this economic transition in in process. All right. So. Now, after the Middle Ages, scholastic philosophy declined, and its place in its place uh, arose a new sense of critical inquiry you know, that looked straight back to the Greeks. Okay, so they dismissed scholastic philosophy. Of course, they were still under the influence of this uh, philosophy, but they wanted to go back to the Greeks which they call the classic. Okay, so the foundation of modern philosophy and science were laid during the 15th and 16th centuries. So the world was opened up both to new thoughts and new explorers. Uh, that's the time when, you know, uh, explorations of the world, uh, the Reformation with its emphasis on individual faith, the rise of commercial urban society and the dramatic appearance of new ideas in all areas of culture this all stimulated a development of a new philosophical worldview now if you're going to go back to the medieval philosophy medieval worldview the worldview of medieval of the medieval world is hierarchical okay the world is considered as a vast machine the parts of which move in accordance with strict physical laws okay without uh <clears throat> so uh the medieval world as a hierarchical order of beings created by god was supplanted by a mechanistic picture of the world as a vast machine. Before, in the medieval philosophy, in medieval world, in medieval philosophy, well, they recognized God as the creator, as a supreme being who designed this world, and therefore the world is governed by the laws, by the divine laws. But in modern philosophy, this world, this picture of the world as governed by a divine being, was uh set aside and it was replaced by a mechanistic picture of the world like a vast machine the parts of which move in accordance with strict physical laws independent of the divine purpose or the divine design or the divine will. Okay. so the work of the italian physicist and astronomer galileo was of even great importance in the development of the new world Galileo brought attention to the importance of applying mathematics to the formulation of scientific laws. Um, this he accomplished by creating the science of mechanics, which apply the principles of geometry to the motions of bodies. So you see, if before, how bodies move in the universe were explained through the will of God or divine providence. Galileo's mechanics is able to apply the principles of geometry and, of course, apply the principles of mathematics in order to explain how bodies move in the universe. 
and the success of mechanics in discovering reliable and useful laws of nature suggested to the Galileo and to the other thinkers and scientists that all nature is designed in accordance with mechanical laws. Now the world can be determined. Now the world can be studied, can be analyzed, if we understand these laws. Now, as to the human life, the aim of human life was no longer conceived as preparation for salvation in the next world, like in the medieval, in this classic period. The aim of life is rather the satisfaction of people's natural desires. Okay? So political institutions and ethical principles cease to be regarded as reflections of the divine command or the divine will and came to be seen as practical devices created by man. In this new philosophical view, experience and reason became the sole standards of truth. So if before, faith and revelation were an authority, of course, were, were the uh, sort of standards of truth. Now, what dominates, what dominated this philosophical worldview are experience, sense experience, and reason. Okay. So, the first great spokesman of the new philosophy was the English philosopher and statesman, Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon denounced reliance on authority and verbal argument and criticized even Aristotle's logic uh, syllogistic logic as useless in the discovery of new laws because for him Aristotelian logic does not add any knowledge okay the conclusion is already found in the premises and therefore it does not guarantee the advancement of knowledge so Bacon called this new scientific uh, method based on induction. It's the inductive method. It is based on inductive generalization from careful observation and experiment. And he was the first to formulate rules of inductive inference. So he wrote a book which is entitled The Novum Organum or The New Organon, referencing the Organon of Aristotle. The Organ of Aristotle is a collection of six books on logical treatises. There are six. They are called collectively Organon, which means tool or instrument for thinking. And Francis Bacon named the title of this book as The New Organon, okay? the new tool or the new instrument. Now, in the 15th and 16th century also, a revival of, so in, in, given this, scenario, there was a revival of scientific interest in nature, which was accompanied by a tendency toward pantheistic mysticism. The Catholic prelate Nicolas of Cusa anticipated the work of the Polish astronomer Nicolas Copernicus in his suggestion that the Earth move around the sun and therefore uh, displacing humanity from the center of the universe. And he also conceived of the universe as infinite and identical with God. You see, from the time of Ptolemy, we, we believe or people believe in the, uh, the geocentric theory where the world or Earth is the center of the universe. Because man finds himself in on earth, in this world, and God or God created man to be the king of his creation, and therefore the king must be at the center of that creation. And because we find man here on earth, then the earth must be the center of the universe. But the philosopher of Cusa suggests, and of course later on to Pernicus, that the earth is not the center of the universe. They would of course, they, uh, they, they, were, they would replace this geocentric 
with a with a heliocentric theory about the world. Okay. The Italian philosopher Giordano, Giordano Bruno, who similarly identified the universe with God, developed the philosophical implication of this of the Copernican revolution of the Copernican theory. Uh, and Bruno's philosophy influenced uh, subsequent intellectual forces or thinkers, and this led to the rise of modern science and to the Reformation. Okay. So, of course, uh, all these uh, new developments at the time were, of course, very critical of the position of the church, and many of these thinkers were actually sanctioned or censored by the church. We know what happened to Galileo. Okay, he was excommunicated and more violent, more brutal was what happened to Giornano Bruno because he was burned at stake uh, for following this Copernican revolution. Okay, because Copernicus was never censored. Uh, he was a, uh, a police, uh, a police prelate, priest. So in philosophy, the search for truth is centered on man and human reason. Human reason was the was liberated from nature and faith. It is not an understatement to say that modern philosophy was characterized by the dominance of reason over faith, uh, of the state over the church, of science and philosophy over theology. And considering all this, it could be said that the modern period is generally characterized as empirical, anthropocentric, and rationalistic. Now, we mentioned that it roughly covers, modern philosophy roughly covers the years from 1450 up to the end of the 700, 1799. Uh, so how do we categorize now uh, modern philosophy? Well, there are many categorizations, okay? but what we can say is that it may be categorized into two historical periods, namely the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. So at the beginning, it's the Renaissance, and then towards the end, we have the Enlightenment. Okay? In our succeeding lectures, we're going to discuss these two. Okay? So the re we're going to re discuss the Renaissance and then later on the Enlightenment. And philosophers also are usually grouped into several you know, several systems, as if, if we can say that. Huh? Namely, the rationalist, or rationalism, and empiricism, or the empiricism. And then towards the end of that modern period, the, these two were integrated into the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. Okay? And then, of course, after Immanuel Kant, we can identify the period of Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel as a kind of absolute idealism. So these are possible categorizations of philosophy from a historical perspective and from the systems that emerge out of that out of the period. Okay. So uh, the Renaissance is a period represented by different philosophers, different kinds of thinkers. Okay. So first you have the uh, the, the the scientists like Copernicus and Galileo Galilei. And then you have the political thinkers like Leo Gugurtius, uh, Niccolò Machiavelli, okay? Well, you can still also add John Kepler into the scientific, to the science group, okay? So basically these are scientists and political thinkers. Rationalism is represented, of course, by the father of modern philosophy, René Descartes, and of course, together with Descartes, you have Benedict Spinoza, uh, Gottfried Leibniz, and then, of course, Nicolas Malibrantz. And then empiricism is represented by, of course, I already mentioned Francis Bacon, uh, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, George Berkeley, was David Hume. And enlightenment can be represented by the French philosophers like Francis Voltaire, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and then uh, some other philosophers like Samuel Clark, John Adam, Christian Wolff, and German idealism, OK? 
can be represented by, as I already mentioned, Fichte, Shelley, and, and Hegel. Okay? Of course, I would consider Kant to be really a, a separate, well, you can, he's German, but you cannot call him an, uh, an idealist. Okay? He, he combined the rationalist and the empiricist idea. Okay? So I would consider Kant to be a philosopher pretty much uh, on his own, you know, Category. Okay, so let's start with the Renaissance. Uh, and Renaissance can be characterized by this, by materialism and mechanism. Okay. So since the 15th century, modern philosophy has been marked by a continuing interaction between systems of thoughts based on a mechanistic, materialistic interpretation of the universe. In those founded on a belief in human thought as the only ultimate reality. This interaction has reflected the increasing effect of scientific discovery and political change on philosophical speculation. The uh, 15th and 16th centuries constituted a period of radical social, political, and even intellectual and more importantly, intellectual development. The explorations of the world, the Reformation, which emphasis on individual faith, the rise of commercial urban society, and the dramatic appearance of new ideas in all areas of culture stimulated this development of a new philosophical worldview. Okay? As we have already mentioned, the medieval worldview was uh, anchored on a hierarchical uh, order of beings created by God, but it was supplanted by this mechanistic uh, picture of the world, like a vast machine whose parts are moving in accordance with strict mechanistic physical laws. And the aim of life is no longer the preparation for salvation, but the satisfaction of people's natural desires. All right. So <clears throat> this period marked a sense of the uh, critical inquiry of new thought. Okay. So there developed a new kind of humanism and a different political theory. So during the Renaissance, a new culture emerged. The world opened to new thoughts and new ideas, and new explorers, and discoveries. Okay. So, uh, now let's go to the empiricism and the empiricism and skepticism. Empiricism believes that all knowledge comes from sense experience. There are no innate ideas. This is reference, of course, from Descartes' position that there are innate ideas. To which John Locke answered, there are no innate ideas. The mind at birth is a tabula rasa. Only those that can be perceived have real value. Okay? If you can trace, and I trace back to an experience, and an idea cannot be traced back to an original experience, then that idea does not have any real value. So empiricism is represented, as already mentioned, by Bacon, Hobbes, Locke, Berkeley, and David Hume. Thomas Hobbes set his philosophical or political philosophy in the book Leviathan. Okay? He said that in the state of nature, man relentlessly pursues survival at the expense of others. Okay? So we are like wolves against fellow wolves. So it's a war of all, no, of all against all, okay? So man, it's like a wolf, but of course, man realized that they cannot fight endlessly. So they have decided to bond together and form a social contract. John Locke is known for his social contract theory also, but he's more interested in individual liberty. And like Hobbes, he theorized that man in the state of nature was good 
they were not quarreling, they were not fighting, but conflicts of interest cannot be avoided because, of course, they have to work for their individual rights. And so they also decided to form a social, social contract and thus establish a civil society. So in his two, two, three, uh, work, two treatises on government, he argued first that there was no divine right for the monarch to rule. And secondly, that man is free, and in this condition, all men are equal. Okay. So man, by their free act, decided to form a society to protect their individual rights. Now, of course, I already mentioned that the first uh, spokesman of this, this new philosophy, new science, actually, is Francis Bacon. So Bacon denounced reliance on authority, criticized Aristotle's philosophy, or logic rather, and established a new scientific method based on inductive generalization. So he was the first to formulate these inductive rules. Uh, well, Thomas Hobbes also constructed a comprehensive system of materialistic metaphysics that provided a solution to the mind-body problem Okay, because, again, referencing Descartes, Descartes theorized that man is composed of two principles, separate principles, mind and body, the rest cogitans and the rest extensa. And Thomas Hobbes presented a uh, mechanistic solution to this mind-body problem, reducing the mind to the internal motions of the body. So for him, the mind is part of the body so that's a kind of materialistic materialistic metaphysics so applying the principles of mechanics to all areas of knowledge he defined the concepts based on each area such like for example life uh, sensation reason value justice in terms of matter and motion and therefore he reduced all phenomena to physical relations in all sciences to mechanics. In his ethical theory, Hobbes also derived the rules of human behavior from the laws of self-preservation and justified egoistic action as the natural human tendency. In his political theory, he maintained that government and social justice are artificial creations based on social contract and maintained by force, by the sovereign authority, the Leviathan, okay? And of course, he supported the absolute monarchy as the most effective means of preserving peace. But this idea about the absolute monarchy is actually a kind of apology or a kind of, you know, uh, a justification for the monarchy at the time, which was the sponsor of Hobbes. Now, John Locke is one of the most influential figures in English thought. He continued uh, the empiricist tradition started by Bacon, and he gave empiricism a systematic framework with the publication of his uh, book, Essay Concerning Human Understanding. Okay. Locke attacked the prevalent rationalistic uh, beliefs in knowledge independent of experience. Okay, because for him, knowledge is based on experience. We cannot separate knowledge from experience. Although he accepted the Cartesian uh, 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 division between mind and body, well, because that's, uh, that's a conception of the card, okay? The, the res cogitans and the res extensa. So while he accepts that and the mechanistic description of nature, he redirected philosophy from the study of the physical world to the study of the mind, to the study of human understanding. Okay, that's the, so that's the main area of, of John Locke. So in so doing, he made epistemology, that is the study of the nature of knowledge, the principal concern of modern philosophy. And Locke, attempted to reduce all ideas 
there are simple elements of experience, but he also distinguished sensation and reflection as sources of experience. Sensation provides the material for knowledge, meaning knowledge of the external world, and reflection provides the material for the knowledge of the mind, for the internal world, meaning our knowledge of ourselves. Well, Lang is not really a skeptic if you're going to compare him to David Hume, but he greatly influenced skepticism of later British thought by recognizing the vagueness of the concepts of metaphysics and by pointing out that influences about the modern world or the, the, about the world outside the mind cannot be proven with certainty. So, the founders of modern school of utilitarianism, which makes happiness for the largest possible number, no, no, becoming the standard right and wrong, drew heavy influence from the writings of John Locke. So, uh, philosophers like Jeremy Bentham, and John Stuart Mill, who were the uh, who were the proponents of utilitarianism, were heavily influenced by the thinking of Locke. Okay, and then of course Locke's defense of constitutional government, religious tolerance, and natural human rights influenced the development of liberal thought in many parts of the world, in France, in the U.S., and of course in uh, in Great Britain, okay, in England. Now. Next is the Scottish philosopher and historian David Hume. Uh, David Hume uh, turned Berkeley's criticism of material substance against Berkeley's own belief in spiritual substance, arguing that no observable evidence is available for the existence of a mind, a divine substance, or spirit, or God. Berkeley believed that there is a mind that perceives the world and therefore by perceiving the world sustains its own existence because george berkeley believed that things exist because they are perceived how about if so if i'm standing in front of this laptop the laptop exists because it is perceived by me how about if I go out of the room in this laptop is no longer in front of me. It ceases to exist. But according to Berkeley, yes, there may be finite minds like our minds, but there is a divine mind that supervises, that perceives everything and therefore sustains its continued existence. To which Hume said, there's no evidence to that. Okay. So, Jung's most important philosophical work, The Thetis of Human Nature, was published actually in three volumes, but, you know, it did not really, uh, was not accepted uh, as, as anticipated by David Jung, and therefore, he tried to revise it and actually publish it in three separate volumes. But anyway, we will be discussing that, those details in uh, in, the, in the other lectures. Okay. Now, the Irish philosopher in Anglican Berkeley, as I've already said, made idealism as a powerful school in Anglo America, thought by combining it with skepticism and empiricism, it became influential in British philosophy. So he extends Locke's doubt about knowledge of the world, considered it outside of the mind, and therefore Berkeley argued that there's no evidence that exists. Uh, for the existence of such a world because the only things that can be observed are one's own sensations and these are in the mind so to exist as we have said he said it means to be perceived okay and of course there is a higher being a divine being that perceives all this okay uh now let's go to the next topic next uh next system rationalism i have already mentioned the rationalist thinkers. So, rationalism believes in the dominance of reason over, over sense experience. So, if the empiricists believe in sense experience as the foundation of knowledge, rationalism believes 
it's reason that is the foundation of knowledge. Knowledge comes from logical and rational deduction. Innate ideas form the only secure basis of knowledge. Okay, there are innate ideas. And of course, I've already mentioned that there are rep this system is represented by Descartes, by Spinoza, by Leibniz, and by Malebrat. So, well, let's focus on René Descartes because he's actually considered to be the father of modern philosophy. He's a French mathematician, physicist, philosopher. And he followed Bacon and Galileo in criticizing existing methods and belief. But unlike Bacon, who argued for the inductive method based on observed facts, Descartes made mathematics the model for all science applying its deductive and analytical methods to all fields of human knowledge. So Descartes published his first major work, okay, Essays in Philosophy, and here is the result to reconstruct all human knowledge on an absolute, absolute certain foundation by refusing to accept any belief, even the belief of his own existence. Okay? even the belief of his own decision, until he could prove it to be necessarily true. Okay? So he doubted everything, including his existence, and tried to question all this, remove all these doubts, until, put this, all these beliefs into doubt, until he reached one particular belief that he cannot doubt anymore. And that's where the famous statement came, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. Okay? Because if I doubt, that means I am thinking. And I cannot think if I don't exist. Okay? Now, incidentally, that's not an original idea of Descartes. Because many Centuries before, St. Augustine already said that. I doubt, therefore, I exist. Because I, how, how, can I, how can I exist if I doubt? Okay, I, I have to exist. Okay, something similar to that. But the, the main idea, this idea of cogito is not original to Descartes because it was first mentioned by St. Augustine. Okay? during the patristic era that we have mentioned before, right? So, from this cogito, Descartes proceeded to uh, prove God's existence, okay, and his own existence, and the existence of the world, okay? So, of course, well, we have already mentioned that he originated this idea of the... Uh, distinction between two substances, the res cogitans, the substance that exists uh, in the, uh, the, the, mental, uh, the mental substance, and then the res extensa, the physical substance. And man is composed of these two substances. He has mind and he has body. But it became problematic because how do we mix, you know, how do we relate these two? He created a problem, this is the mind-body problem, no? which he was not able to resolve and have been the concern of philosophy, especially those immediately succeeded René Descartes. Okay? So, well, of course, Descartes was credited for his methodic now, starting the starting point of his philosophic investigation, and through this methodic doubt, he arrived at certain knowledge. Okay? <clears throat> Uh, now, let's focus on the next philosopher, Benedict Spinoza. He's a Dutch philosopher, well, uh, actually a Jew, who migrated to to Netherlands. He constructed a remarkably precise and rigorous system of philosophy that offered a new solution to the mind-body problem started by Descartes. Okay? And... He also 
uh, offered solution to the conflict between religion and science and the mechanistic elimination of ethical values from the natural world. Like Descartes, he maintained that the entire structure of nature can be deduced from a from few basic you know, definitions and actions, like the model of the geometry of Euclid. Okay, so Spinoza saw that uh, Spinoza saw that uh, Descartes' theory of two substances created. Uh, created uh, some kind of an insoluble problem you know, of the way in which the mind and body interact. So he concluded that the only ultimate subject of knowledge must be substance itself. Okay? Substance. There's only one substance. You cannot separate substance into two. There's only one substance. So in attempting to demonstrate that, he said that this substance is God. God, substance, nature are identical. There's only one substance, identical with God and nature. And therefore, he arrived at a kind of a pantheistic monism no? uh, that all things are all aspects or modes of God. Okay, so that's Spinoza. Of course, we're going to discuss Spinoza's solution to this problem. No? Uh, well, by the way, just to mention, uh, this problem is the solution to the problem is called the psychophysical parallelism, which explains that the apparent interaction between the mind and body that we can observe no? based on our experience uh, as two forms of the same substance. That just run exactly parallel to each other. Okay, so uh, it's like uh, it's 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 like a, a, a two clocks that are synchronous, no? That run uh, synchronously. No? Now, of course, you have the German philosopher Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. And he developed a, a subtle and original system of philosophy. He combined the mathematical and physical discoveries of his time with the organic and religious conceptions of nature. All right. And he found, uh, he found this in the ancient and medieval thought. Okay. So, he subscribed to the idea of the medieval and ancient about the substantial forms. Substantial forms are like, uh, they are the vital principles, they are like energies. Okay? But uh, Leibniz interpreted this as kind of uh, small units of forces. They are indivisible. They are infinite in numbers. And call this the monads. Monads, mono, mona, meaning one, one, one indivisible unit, right? So it's it's like it's like the atom, okay? It's like the atom. And he considered the world to be composed of infinite numbers of monads, right? But God is also a monad. Hmm? But God is the monad of all monads, no? who created all the other monads, okay? So, he also developed this theory about the pre-established harmony that results in the interaction between the monads. You see, God have already created the monads and he already programmed the, the monads to be in harmony with each other, okay? So, that's the pre-established harmony. Anyway, we're going to discuss that in detail in our uh, subsequent lectures. Now let's go to the next, Enlightenment. So Enlightenment is characterized by a release of human reason from the confines of any form of authority. 
Enlightenment is already towards the middle and towards the end of the modern era. Okay, so uh, the Enlightenment thinkers called this period, their period, as the period of enlightenment. No less than Immanuel Kant said that we are now in the Enlightenment period. Enlightenment because, well, the Renaissance is the rebirth of reason. Okay, Rebirth because there was already the birthing of reason during the time of the Greeks. It died during the medieval era. Now it is born again. It is revived in the modern era during the Renaissance. Renaissance as revival or rebirth. And then the full blooming of reason is during the Enlightenment. So in reason already attained its full freedom. Okay? Freedom from any forms of authority. Religious authority, you know, political authority. And it proposed that the aim of life is life itself. Not the afterlife. Okay? Believes that the essential conditions for a good life on earth is freeing man's mind from ignorance and superstition. Uh, religion is superstition for them. That man, if he is free from ignorance and arbitrary powers of the state, man could be capable of progress and perfection. So everything according to this view is interconnected and forms part of a grand scheme of a benevolent providence. So the Enlightenment philosophers, as we have already mentioned, well, we have Voltaire, Rousseau, Clark, Wolf, okay? And we can also, of course, Immanuel Kant add to the mix. So the Enlightenment century writers claim that during the age of Enlightenment, reason made its good, made good its promise, okay? It showed the way to progress in science, philosophy, and religion, politics, and even in the arts. So the pure and brilliant light of reason was able to overcome the darkness caused by prejudice, caused by superstition, and by dogma under which, according to them, humanity had previously labored and lived. And of course, they are pertaining to the medieval era. Okay? So this new culture with its new brand of philosophy introduced an age of enlightenment through the light of reason to dispel the darkness of the past. Okay? You see, they regard the medieval as the Dark Ages, not only because of the numerous wars that happened during the medieval, but because it was a Dark Age for reason, because reason was covered by religion, by superstition. Okay. So, in fact, they were the ones who called that period, it should be the Middle Ages, right? But they call it medieval, and you say something is medieval, it is old and passe. Medieval, old and passe for them. And therefore, these modern thinkers, the Renaissance and the Enlightenment thinkers, they want to go back to the Greeks because the Greeks is what they call the classical period. And you know what we mean by classic, it is old but timeless. Right? So, the modern thinkers, the Renaissance and the Enlightenment thinkers, they want to go back to the classic. Okay? Because that's where the first full shining of reason happened. Okay? So, these writers and thinkers referred to their age as the age of Enlightenment. And that means breaking from the past replacing the obscurity, the darkness, the prejudices, and ignorance of European thought based on the medieval past with the light and guidance of reason. And of course, in France, 
this intellectual activity culminated in the period no uh, in the in culminated in the French Revolution actually. No? And among the leading thinkers of this period, we have as already mentioned Voltaire, who developed the tradition of theism, began of course by Locke and other liberal thinkers. And then reduce religious beliefs to those that can be justified by rational inference from the study of nature. And then, of course, there is Jean Jacques Rousseau. Well, he also developed his own social contract theory. He criticized civilization as a corruption of humanity's nature. And he developed Hobbes' uh, doctrine that the state is based on social contract with citizens and represents the popular will. Then, of course, you have uh, just to mention Denis Diderot, who founded the famous Encyclopedia, to which many scientists and philosophers of the time contributed. Now, then, of course, we have to mention the, one of the most important philosophers in modern era the philosophy Immanuel Kant. Philosophy of Immanuel Kant and of course George Hegel uh, were the culminating point of modern philosophy. Uh, of course, through the influence of Kant, idealism and voluntarism uh, became the dominant tendencies in, in Germany. You have Fichte who transformed uh, Kant's uh, critical idealism into an absolute idealism by eliminating Kant's uh, idea of the things in themselves. Okay, again, I'm just mentioning this. Um, this is uh, this is part of the introduction, but we're going to discuss this in details in the succeeding lectures. So, as I have already mentioned, Kant's philosophy is a systematic synthesis of empiricism and rationalism. And he proposed an ethics based on individual conscience, based on uh, the categorical imperative, based on duty. Well, he, is, he wrote the three famous great critiques, the critique of pure reason, the critique of practical judgment, and the, I'm oh, sorry, the critique of practical reason, and then the critique of judgment. Well, in the pure reason, just to, you know, introduce this, uh, this idea, uh, he set out to discover the true uh, capacities of thought, to, to, to critique reason itself by using reason uh, and set what would be the limit of our knowledge. Okay, So he distinguished two forms of knowledge, the a priori, which is knowledge coming purely from reasoning, independent of experience, and then the a posteriori, which is knowledge coming from experience. And for him, knowledge comes from the synthesis of these two. No? It's a synthesis of experience and concepts. Because without sense experience, we cannot be aware of any object. And without understanding or without reason, we cannot form any conception of it. So somehow he was able to combine the uh, the ideas, the positions of the empiricists and the rationalists. Okay. Uh, now, lastly, let's go to the other philosophers, especially uh, Hegel. So another influential philosophical mind of the of this philosophy of this period is the German philosopher Hegel, Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. A system of absolute idealism, although influenced greatly by Kant and Schelling, was based on a new conception of logic, a new conception of logic, in which conflict and contradiction are regarded as necessary elements of truth. And truth is regarded as a process rather than a fixed state of things. The source of all reality, he said, is an absolute spirit or a cosmic reason which develops from abstract undifferentiated being 
into more and more concrete reality by a dialectical process consisting of triadic stages. And each triad involves an initial state, which he calls the thesis, and then its opposite state, which he calls the antithesis, and then the higher state, the combination of the two, which he calls the synthesis. So the synthesis unites the two opposites. And according to this view, history is governed by logical laws so that all that is real is rational and all that is rational is real. All right. Later historical forms are more complete fulfillment. The, the later historical forms are the more complete fulfillment of the absent spirit, whose highest stage of self realization is found in the natural state <coughs> excuse me, and in philosophy. So Hegel represented uh, or stimulated a greater interest in the history by presenting or representing it as a deeper penetration into reality than natural science. There are so many things to discuss here, but just so you will know that this is the whole of uh, uh, modern philosophy is a very broad uh, area in the history of Western philosophy. And many of the most important philosophers are found during this era. And it's very important for a serious student of philosophy to understand modern philosophy. So we will continue this discussion in the next lectures, in the succeeding lectures of the series. So stay you know, stay tuned for that. Uh, and so, in the next lectures, I will be providing now the details of this of this introduction. I will be discussing them one by one, you know, their contribution to the history of Western philosophy. So, thank you very much for listening. Uh, stay tuned for the next uh, for the next lecture. Uh, stay safe and God bless.